Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Frederick. I'm here because I love good design. I care a lot about design, so much that uh, uh, I rarely get an app done because uh, by the time it's completed, I already have ideas for how to redesign it again. And eventually I go so deep into caring about the design process that uh, I'm spending most of my time researching new methods for designing apps and not so much uh, doing any finished apps at all. This research has uh, taken me into learning about the history of design, both in general and uh, design of human-computer interaction, and uh, also systems design that is not in the user interface, where it's possible to use a theory of computation to make uh, things that are much cooler than having some uh, junior programmer writing by hand. Berno is a really good city because there's so much design to see here. Here's one example, it's Villa Togenhut. If any one of you got to see the inside of this, you're really lucky. Tickets have to be booked months in advance. And in uh, computers and user interfaces, the main historical thing in design was a small talk system created in the 1970s. And it has a related project, the Dynapad, which is when the tablet computer was invented. And the purpose back then was not to make uh, people consumers in an app store. The purpose was to teach children about programming. So it had to be easy to make uh, an app with a graphical user interface because it was tested on 12-year-old children. They found out that uh, it, it should not take more than 20 lines of code to make a user interface, a graphical user interface, because that's as much as a child can keep in their head. But um, the Xerox Alto computer that they used, it to, was not affordable to everyone, back in the 1970s at least. So the rest of the world still stuck with text-based interfaces. This is uh, an example that people still use today. It's a, a top uh, command that uh, you have in Linux. Th this is uh, not what I consider modern UX design. I wish someone would change it. Uh, but uh, maybe people like uh, to torture other people with this kind of old user interfaces that require a lot of expert knowledge. If I were to redesign this, I would have it look more like this instead. In the previous example, you have ASCII art uh, for outlining the tree of processes. Here you have instead uh, a graphics uh, drawn as OpenGL shaders. Because these days, we don't need the, the 1980s home computers. We have things that are even more powerful than the Xerox Alto that was used to make graphical user interfaces back in the 1970s. We can run OpenGL shaders everywhere, make beautiful user interfaces. And unlike the top command on Linux, here you can actually use a mouse. You can resize, reorganize these columns. You can open the information about a column to see the statistical distribution of values in the column. Here's another example. This is a, a tool called Criterion RS that is a, the leading tool for making benchmarks in Rust. And people are very proud of this tool because uh, you can measure things very exactly, accurately, with many details to the measurements. And uh, people generally think that it's quite a good design of a user experience. Which I would beg to differ. I, I think it's painful to see this slowly scroll uh, as the tests are completing. And you don't really get an overview of the test results. 
they do give an option to get an overview. Like after all of this is completed, which may take a long time, you can open an HTML page with an overview, uh, which also looks like there was no designer behind it. So here, here I can click one of my benchmark cases and get more statistics about it. Looks like this like, typical HTML page like you had in the 1990s that you had to scroll. What I would suggest is that we instead have a graphical user interface where you can interactively navigate your benchmarks. Here I can select the benchmark cases and start them and stop them whenever I like. Uh, I see the graphics being rendered during the time the benchmarks are being done. I don't have to wait for everything to complete. I can interactively edit these numbers that I'm benchmarking instead of going back to the source code and recompile it and do all the test cases again. I can click at benchmark at any time to get up more details about it, where I can uh, move the mouse around and uh, find out uh, the exact numbers for any of these sample points. Because nowadays we have uh, mice in computers. Like uh, back in 1968, when it was first used experimentally, but uh, we had this, this time of terminals when people didn't have mice, only text-based interfaces. Here I can also interactively edit the settings while the benchmarks are still running, if, if I want to try something again with new settings. The problem I see is that people are still designing their apps for VT100 terminals. Uh, so so th this is not a kind of terminal you can go to, to the store and buy these days. If you buy something, you would get something with programmable shader pipeline where you can run as cool graphical effects as you want. Uh, but still people write their apps for this old computer that gets emulated in uh, modern computers. And it's because it's easy. People don't really have the help from frameworks to make more modern graphical user interfaces. I'm making my own experimental framework, uh, which of course I, I cannot hand out today because as I said, everything is obsolete even before it's completed. So I will have to take even another round of iteration to get even more cool new features in it. But before I complete and release my framework, I would like to give my best ideas away to anyone else who's making frameworks. So maybe you can make some framework that will be done before the one I'm making. Here's the idea that I have. To make a modern framework that people actually like to use instead of making apps for the VT100 terminal or, or HTML pages. The framework should first of all allow the programmer to use an agreeable programming language. And the programming language that is the hottest now, or at least what was the hottest until the trademark scandal last week, is Rust. And modern programming languages have dependency management. You shouldn't have to go to some FTP server, download a lot of framework components and compile them. All that should be needed to use a modern framework is to add one line to the file declaring your dependencies, and next time you compile, the dependency will automatically be downloaded. If we don't have that feature, then people will still make their programs for the VT100 terminal because they can use the simple libraries that are very easy to add as a dependency. There should also be no bloat. In modern programming languages, the compiler and linker can see what features of a library you are using and remove the code for the other features. But for this to work, the framework has to be designed this way that the, the the graph of how you're calling one function from another needs to clearly express what features are using so the compiler can remove the other features. If we have the traditional object-oriented design of a GUI framework, then 
Like we, we don't really know which features are being used in the end because any object could exist anywhere on the heap and the compiler cannot remove objects that are not being used. A modern framework should also make it simple to do things that are inherently simple. Like if I just want to draw a rectangle to the screen, I, I should be able to do that. I shouldn't have to go through a long tutorial of a framework uh, teaching all kinds of components and, and then in the last chapter how to make a custom component and when I make a custom component first then am I allowed to know how to draw a rectangle to the screen. One thing we should also have in the future of frameworks is that you can write once and not just run everywhere but also test once before you run everywhere. This is something we don't have with the web frameworks that people are now using instead of native apps. I'd like the native app frameworks to be so easy to use so that people don't have to use the web frameworks to make it work easier. And when we use these web frameworks, we depend on the different web browsers on every platform so that an app may work when you test it on your work computer, but when you want to deploy the same app on iOS, it has to run in iOS Safari, which adds 100 bugs to your app, so you need to test the entire app again. If we put the rendering completely inside the app instead of depend on external frameworks to render the app, we eliminate that problem. People sometimes say that we should use the native frameworks of the platform because they like the apps to look native. Uh, I don't quite agree with this. In my experience, uh, people don't care if an app looks native as long as the app looks good. We should do well-designed apps instead. And I wish it would be better education in how to design good apps. Something like this Bauhaus school that uh, was around a hundred years ago or so. Uh, the architect of the Villa Tugendhat from Bernal that I showed in the beginning, it's also one that's associated with this Bauhaus, which makes it so interesting. Oh, here it comes again. In the Bauhaus, they had a curriculum of how they work with different materials and color studies, material studies, geometry studies, compositional studies. And if you look at the designs, well, there are some things that don't look quite modern because the materials they used back then were not modern, but the rest of the design looks like it could, could have been made today because they came up how, with how to design things in a timeless manner. Before the Bauhaus, if a chair came out of a factory, then even though it's factory made, this chair imitated the design that a carpenter would make by hand. Whereas the Bauhaus would look at what materials and processes available in a factory. They see a factory can bend tabular steel. So they design a lot of chairs made out of tabular steel. A hundred years later after Bauhaus, we have Google making their material design. Here you can see them doing material studies, light studies, seeing how the shadow comes off this uh, three-dimensional shape. More light studies. Compositional studies. Typographic studies. Everything the same as the Bauhaus did a hundred years earlier without mentioning a thing about the Bauhaus. But it's great to see that the influence still lives on. And that's why material design still looks so good today as it did uh, uh, a bit over 10 years ago when it was first designed. Not every detail of it, there are some details that are just weird and wacky and they're experimenting, but the rest of it is timeless design. Now 
Now, for the future of frameworks, there should be a programming language that people actually want to use. And this is critical for the adaptation of frameworks. There are frameworks made in Rust, but the, the ordinary person is really scared of using Rust, and it's not maintainable to them. C++, should I say. I'm mixing things up already. Uh, with Rust, we for the first time have a language that uh, allows uh, the people doing low-level system integration to use the same language as the people who uh, do the UI and scripting and such. So, in general, the reason to use Rust is it is a well-designed language. It's also a very high-level language. Here I have a little example to point out what's a high-level language. There's no example that can show the entire picture of what amazing things you can do with the current state of high-level languages. But just a basic example, if uh, we are to write some efficient code in assembly, it would be like the code on the right. And then we have to care about what register on the processor to put each value. Or we could use a high-level language, write the code on the left instead. The code on the left is easy to read and more maintainable. And traditionally, people believe that we have to choose between writing the high-performance code on the right or the high-level code on the left. But uh, modern languages and compilers are so good that we can write uh, the high-level code on the left and the assembly code is automatically generated through an optimizing compiler. Now to show how modern high-level languages go even further, I can uh, rewrite uh, the high-level code in a completely different way. Instead of having a number of uh, four different terms that I manually multiply and add each one, I could go really crazy and create an iterator. And the iterator is a data structure in itself, which, which has a certain size. And in other languages in Rust, you would have to allocate the iterator on the heap, and you would have to garbage collect it afterwards. And I create not just one iterator here. For the two inputs to this function, I create one iterator, then another iterator for the other input, and then a third iterator to zip these two inputs, and a fourth iterator to, to map over this combined iterator. I create another closure that is sent to the map iterator. Then I create a fifth iterator, which is a reduce iterator, given another closure that has to be created and sent into the iterator. because uh, Rust allows uh, the compiler to tell exactly how these iterators are working internally. The assembly code on the right is still exactly the same as the example without iterators. Instruction by instruction is all the same. So I don't have to choose between like, manually writing each of the multiplications and additions uh, and, and using iterators. In other languages, Someone might say, we, we cannot use this iterator because the performance would be too low. Whereas here, it makes absolutely no difference whatsoever. And if I like, I can even make this function generic. So now, instead of having four values in the input arrays, I have n values, where n is a constant number, where you can put in any number, and, and the compiler will give you a new function for each different number. And just for this example to work, I have an example function below that sets it to four inputs. We can see that the assembly code that comes out is still exactly the same. And now reusing the same code, I can create another example function that has two inputs instead of four. 
So I get two different functions in the assembly code specialized for these two different input sizes running each special case in the highest possible speed, which is important here because it's an audio processing algorithm and if I use these iterators without turning optimization on, it would run like, too slow, the audio would be choppy. I can go even more crazy and here I remove the generics, just have a variable sized array, but the compiler doesn't really care, it sees that it's probably better to to make a different copy of the function for the two different input sizes uh, and make them two special cases. That's uh, why Rust is a good language in general, but why is Rust a good language especially for apps? I would say because it's a versatile language, both horizontally versatile and vertically versatile. For the horizontal versatility, Every Rust compiler is a cross compiler. So you develop your program on one platform, you compile it for any platform. And really works on all platforms. It can make optimized native code for any platform, plus it can do WebAssembly output that you can run on the platforms that don't allow running native code. And uh, what comes out to the compiler will be dependency free. So you can easily combine it with another program without bloating it. You don't need to install a Rust time, runtime on the target system. For the vertical versatility, you can use Rust to develop the full stack of your app, all from the low level system integration uh, and uh, the high performance algorithms to the graphical user interface it runs on top, and, and even if you want to do some, some scripting and testing, you still make that in Rust, because Rust is a good language, even for writing easy things, not only for writing the difficult things. And what makes this also so great, gets all of these good things together, is the dependency management. You just declare what dependency you have. The compiler automatically downloads and puts everything together. Now to do this uh, custom design instead of using the native uh, frameworks of the operating system. It, in my experience, I've only needed to use very few graphical primitives. Everything in uh, the screenshots you saw before is composed out of these six primitives. A, a rectangle, a glyph that can be used to compose any text, a circle that you can also crop if you want to make rounded corners that don't look like a full circle, a card according to the material design specification. This card has a stack of two drop shadows that are Gaussian blurs at different radii. Uh, and this render is one open GL shader, so it's pretty efficient. You don't need to first, first to draw the card into a buffer and then apply blur to it twice. And you want to be able to display images. Uh, and one little pet feature I have here is a wavy line, which is good for underlining uh, spelling mistakes and other linter related things in when I'm making software for writing code. I think that we shouldn't have to write all code manually. We should have it automatically generated. Now people keep asking me, what, what will happen with ChatGPT automatically generating code for people? I say that, that that's not really the way I think the future will go. In, instead of having a code that is so boring that you can automatically generate it using AI. We could have a platforms that allow you to describe the high level behavior of our program and then we can from that specification automatically generate code every time you build the app. 
here is an example of a domain-specific language for specifying command lines. There are the command line parsers that try to do this inside the ordinary programming language. You create some command line parser object that has to interpret the options you give to this object, and it all bloats your program. Whereas here, you write the specification before you compile your program, and out comes the optimized code for parsing the command line specific to your app only, not a runtime that can parse command lines that are not relevant to your app. I would like it to be easy to develop new domain-specific languages. And I think there are so many problems that can be easily solved by having domain-specific languages for them. So this is a, a new approach to domain-specific languages that is a universal language where you can, in this language, specify the schema of another language. And then you write a program in this new language that you just specified, and it took five minutes to specify. Otherwise, when you create a new language, you have to solve all these boring problems again, like should there be tabs or spaces for indentation? Whereas using this universal language, you don't have to solve the problem. The problem has already been solved for you. And to this particular question, should there be tabs or spaces for indentation, there is one correct answer. And the correct answer is no. There are no tabs or spaces here. These are just tokens or building blocks. And this app is free to lay them out in any layout because there aren't any tabs or spaces to restrict what part of the screen this app can display each part of the document. And the program can also interpret what you're giving, what you're writing at the term, at the time that you're writing it, and display this table of contents and explanations of this selected token and provide auto-completion even for really big things, just because it has a schema of the language. Uh, syntax analysis here is not, not an optional feature. It's not something extra that you had to put extra work in because the language was defining a schema to begin with. It all comes for free. So when you resize this document, the document reflows. So we also don't need to have any coding style telling how long should a line be. Well, it's up to the app that displays the code to format it in the most beautiful way possible. Oh, also, the parenthesis here, if you look in the middle, uh, we have the full screen option. We have a start parenthesis, an end parenthesis. If I resize it, well, the parenthesis flows, so there's only one multi-line parenthesis on the left. We don't have to display one on the right anymore. So the latest iteration I'm doing before I have some free width that, can, that I can release is to generate everything from a specification. Here's a, an experiment that I did in TypeST. So TypeST is this very unexpected surprise that suddenly some guys decide to make a modern replacement to LaTeX that is so easy that you can actually use it. And not only use it for like the basic things that uh, someone decided you can use it for in 1995 and, and no one knows how to maintain the code anymore. But this is a functional programming language where you can make documents as complex as you like with as much logic as you like and they're still easy to understand. Here I wrote a, a modern remake of the specification of the classic format sound font. The classic specification is quite painful. It's a PDF that repeats itself a lot, and you need to have some, some code monkey sit and read that PDF and try to copy everything exactly into code for every language you're implementing sound font. My idea here is that instead of having a PDF that you have to have like a managing suit or tie telling a, a group of code monkeys to implement by hand, 
we can write the specification in a machine readable form. So here on the left, you see the data, which is the source of the specification. And the typed document source code only also contains a function that transforms this data into documentation that is beautiful to read. And you see the documentation immediately rendered on the right. All the numbers in these tables are automatically generated. All the sizes of this, the tables, uh, the byte offsets of each field in a table. So they are always guaranteed to be correct. E even if you modify some field in this specification, all the other fields would automatically be updated. And from the same specification, I also generate an implementation as Rust code. And for the final part, uh, I have some apps uh, where I want uh, the user to be able to install extensions to provide new features to the app. So I had to figure out what's the best approach to do that. And I have a list of requirements here. Extensions have to be compact. We shouldn't have some popular app store where, where people say, oh, this app is lightweight because it's only 70 megabytes. No, extensions for your app should be really compact. They should be machine readable so you can distribute an extension, install it on any platform. It should provide security. If you install an extension from untrusted author, it shouldn't be able to access your private data. The extension format should also be a good compilation target. We shouldn't force uh, authors of extensions to write them in a particular programming language. We can see, for example, JavaScript, which used to be a programming language where people write the code, but now JavaScript has become a compilation target. You always use uh, a compiler tool chain to, to compile your source code into JavaScript that then runs in the browser. But better make an extension format that is designed to be a good compilation target to begin with, so not a text format. And the runtime should be embeddable, so not, not something big like the JVM that you have to install as an external dependency. It should generate efficient machine code. Many languages previously used for making extensions to apps are designed to be interpreted, not compiled to efficient machine code. You can have a JIT compiler that tries to optimize it, but since the language was in first place not designed to be compiled into machine code, the JIT has to be very complex and also prepared to de-optimize your code when it meets some edge case. The machine code should be able to run without any runtime overhead. So to combine with this with a security requirement, the security of the program has to be verified before the program runs. So we don't have any runtime overhead for verifying security of all the code being run. It should be possible to send messages between the host and the extension and to send messages between two different extensions so we can build a better ecosystem of extension collaborating with each other. And these messages should also have the security so one extension cannot access the private data of another extension. And these messages should be possible to send without copying the contents of the message. If you send a string from one extension to the other, you should only be able to copy the pointer, not the string data itself. Some, some applications you see can be extended by adding DLL files. And DLL files allow a compiling into efficient machine code and they have no runtime overhead, but they also have no security and only work on one machine that they were compiled for. You see programs adding Lua for scripting, which makes it machine independent and, and the language has security. It doesn't allow interacting with any data that you haven't exposed through the Lua API. 
uh, but it's not a good language for generating efficient machine code. And Lua is also not a good language for programmers. The only reason you would write Lua is that you're forced to. It's also not a good compilation target if you're writing your programs in another language and you want to compile them to Lua. And the JVM is pretty similar, even though it's not a text-based language, it's a byte-oriented language. And JVM was initially designed with security, so one class cannot access the private data of another class. And just by, uh, by injecting only the classes that you want someone to be able to access, you have security, you, you know that they cannot open another class that they shouldn't be allowed to open. Um, but this failed to get popular with Java, so, so security in Java got deprecated. And nowadays you have to run Java in a container, which is very expensive. There's a more modern format called WebAssembly. It's basically C in the browser. That's how it works. It's a machine-independent format, a byte-oriented format uh, that uh, is designed closely to how machines work in general, but not for any machine in particular. So when you load the WebAssembly code, you do one final compilation step to turn it into optimized code for your particular machine. It is secure, one model cannot access the private memory of another model. But the type system is very lacking. It's seen in the browser, so you have, have only the C types, like small integer types and pointers to memory. And this memory cannot be shared with other modules. You also cannot shrink the memory after you've grown it. So there's no deallocation. So with that, uh, the, there is some critical disadvantage to every extension format. But the, there is an interesting way to make a format that overcomes all these disadvantages. One that has the type-based security like Java used to have before it was deprecated and it also compiles to efficient machine code like WebAssembly. And this is uh, by using the Rust type system, which is one that works really well, not just for programmers, but also for verifying the security of our program. So we could have a compiler that doesn't remove the type information from the program as it's compiled, but keeps enough type information that the the computer receiving this program can, just by verifying the type information, know that the program is safe to run without having any runtime overhead for checking the security. So I, I propose for extensibility now to have a, a format for distributing extensions. It's a Rust-like type system that provides the security with the types checked on compile time when you install the extension, not on runtime, and allows making efficient machine code just as fast as running a, an unsafe DLL file, and allows, like in the Rust programming language, to borrow a value that is owned by another module, or even move a value from one module to another by only moving the pointer, not the underlying data and the type system itself would ensure that, that there's only one owner of this pointer and you cannot call any private methods that belong to someone else. I have some details to how it works also. The first choice when you make a format uh, for distributing programs is should be a, it be a stack machine or a register machine. Stack machines are, are machines that every instruction you run, it takes the topmost values on, on a stack of values. If you do one plus two, you might have one and two on top of the stack. You run the plus instruction, which takes these two values off the stack and puts the result onto the stack. 
with a register-based machine would instead have each instruction contain uh, the register number of the different operators that go into that instruction. And there are different opinions in those designing these machines, what is the best. But the, the one system that uh, makes a final conclusion about what's better than the other is Lightbeam, which is a suggested improvement to WebAssembly that simplifies it to a stack machine. It shows that stack machines can be made very compact and they will also run as fast as register-based machines because we're converting it to a different kind of machine on compile time, so we don't have to interpret the stack. So finally, Two slides left. So, a code example, uh, if I have a function that, uh, that encodes one byte as a hexadecimal number, how I would compile it to the proposed format is these instructions. I could go through and explain these instructions, but uh, I, I don't need to take all the time for that. You just come ask afterwards if you're interested in how these instructions work. And in total, these instructions are 14 bytes long, uh, significantly shorter than the source code for this function. So that's the end. And if there's time for questions, I'd be happy to take some. And I'm happy with also the more critical questions if someone disagree with me, because I might have some interesting information about uh, why there are different opinions. Um, um, you mentioned uh, in previous slides, slides as an option, uh, the Lua, mm -hmm. and your remark was that it's not very efficient, but also have you considered in that category uh, LuaJIT, which generates uh, impressively efficient uh, machine code on fly? Yes, I have considered that. And uh, everything that's published by the Lua people says it's impressively efficient because they're only comparing against themselves. They're not comparing against other things that are actually efficient. The way Lua is designed, the compiler doesn't know what type will be at what place at what time. So the compiler is not allowed to make most of the optimizations that are required to make an efficient compiler today. So LuaJIT is efficient compared to whatever they are measuring against, but it's not efficient compared to, uh, let's say, WebAssembly. All right, thank you. So I don't see any other questions. So thank you very much for your talk.